of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere hit a record high this year. This is according to a United Nations report released this week. It says global temperatures have also risen by about 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Scientists say a temperature rise beyond 1.5 or 2 degrees will lead to far worse impacts from climate change across the world, including droughts, stronger storms and extreme sea level rise. But to tell us more, I'm joined via Zoom from the Kenyan capital Nairobi by Africa Regional Climate Change Coordinator for the United Nations. Environment Program, Dr. Richard Munang. Dr. Munang, a very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Globe. Thank you for having me. Well, the report essentially paints a very grim picture when it comes to the effects of climate change. Now, take us through what the findings of this report mean for the world and in particular for Africa. Yeah, thank you very much um, uh, for having me. And um, I will start with an African proverb, uh, which goes to us that uh, there are no shortcuts to the top of the palm tree. And when you read through this uh, United in Science 2020 report, um, which uh, the United Nations Environment Program, in collaboration with other agencies, scientific agencies across the entire globe, it points to the fact that there are no shortcuts to addressing climate change because climate change has not stopped. For COVID-19. And when you look at this report, what it unequivocally points to is that the changing climate during the lockdown across the entire globe uh, in April 2020, uh, emissions, carbon, daily carbon emissions reduced by about 17%. Uh, and these are benchmark against the levels of 2019. But in June, when we started to see the easing of by many countries, uh, the emissions started to increase up to about 5%. So what we are also seeing from this report, the report points to the results that between 2016 and 2020, these are actually the warmest years since uh, pre-industrial levels. And so one conclusion of this report is the changing climate has not stopped for COVID-19. And therefore, the drought and the floods, the climate change is actually turbocharging across the entire world. We may continue to see that if action is not taken. Dr. Munang, there was a lot of hope and uh, you know, belief that the factory shutdowns as a result of lockdowns around the world would actually have a positive impact on the emissions of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Was this not the case? Well, this report points that this was not the case, that what we saw was temporal. And as economies will start to rejuvenate themselves back, we're going to see an increase in uh, carbon emissions, as the report has already shown that the easing up of lockdown have actually seen economic activities which are resulting to the increase in carbon emissions. And therefore, it means COVID-19 or any other emergencies, climate change, cannot actually be stopped just by an event or an emergency like COVID-19. The actions to drive climate action and actually lower emissions so that we don't reach the dangerous climate change above two degrees needs to be taken by every actor across the entire world. When you say that uh, it was only temporary, do you, are you suggesting uh, that you know, we did not make any gains insofar as uh, you know, protecting our atmosphere? The gains were temporary, and the report pointed to that, because in 2019, November, the United Nations Environment Program released a report, which is a flagship report of the United Nations Environment Program called the Emissions Gap Report, which shows that to be able to reduce temperatures to the 1.5 degrees, we need to reduce emissions as a global community by 7% between now and 2030. And if that doesn't happen, we are going to be in a climate emergency era. And the COVID-19 from the United in Science report points very clearly that these temporal emissions that were reduced by 17% have started to increase. And as the lockdowns is up and will open up, then we will go back to where we were post-COVID, before COVID. 
Now, the report also talks about the need for transformational action to close the emission gap. So what actions uh, can African countries take to drive the climate change uh, agenda, uh, given some of the challenges confronting the continent, such as poverty and inequality? The reality is that the African continent is actually already suffering from the impacts of climate change. There are studies that have shown within 20 countries, among 20 countries, 60% of those 20 countries are women faster than the entire globe. When you put this within the context of high poverty levels, high unemployment levels across the entire continent today, and you juxtapose it with food insecurity, the key thing that Africa is facing is socioeconomic, low levels of socioeconomic development, which are actually contributing to Africa's climate vulnerability as we see. But when you put all this in perspective, it means that the building back post-COVID-19 needs to be done better and different. Different in that it must focus in areas that Africa have actually got an advantage in. And these areas are the agricultural sector and the clean energy sector. But this must be done in a way that works with nature, works with the environment, not against the environment. And if you look across the continent today, 257 million citizens go to bed hungry. We see youth graduating into the labor market each and every day, competing for fewer jobs. And each year, Africa needs to create 12 million jobs. When you put this in perspective, within the current challenges that we face, COVID-19, the changing climate, it's imperative then to start looking how do you lift people from the bottom of the pyramid, especially the informal sector people who contribute up to about 80% of the jobs in sub-Saharan Africa. It means there needs to be a different approach to build back better and to build back different, which is to use a system thinking approach, which simply means if you look at the agricultural sector that employs over 60% of the entire workforce in the continent, these agricultural sector actually produce and loses food worth 48 billion US dollars. Why? Because of lack of value addition. So if climate action solutions like solar dryers can be decentralized to these farmers to be able to leverage, to add value, they will be recouping the 48 billion US dollars and actually building their socioeconomic resilience, which is actually the best way to build climate resilience in communities, especially in the informal sector. Another aspect which is very important are the youth. We have a continent with over 60% of the population youthful, but at the same time, the youth are actually 60% unemployed. To be able to engage them in climate action solutions that build their resilience as the countries get back from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and address climate change, there is need to be able to skill them, to retool their skills so that they can be able to adapt their skills to tap into climate action solutions like turning agricultural waste to bar fertilizers or turning waste to briquettes that re replaces charcoal. These are simple actions that can actually be incentivized. And so the stimulus packages that countries are actually giving out, it's better and crucial to leverage on these low-hanging fruits and leverage on low-risk institutions like local cooperatives in communities to be able to build and provide opportunities for the young people to tap into to drive transformational climate action for people and planet. You know, Dr. Myung, another issue perhaps raised in the report is that climate change is projected to increase the number of uh, water-stressed regions and uh, sort of exacerbate the shortages in other regions. I would imagine some of these regions are here on the continent. So what can be the possible mitigating steps that countries can take to lessen the impact very important question. What the report is saying and previous reports have actually shown is that there are going to be extremity or extreme events. Climate change will turbocharge and supercharge these extreme events of floods and droughts. And one of the critical aspects that needs to be looked into is agricultural production failure will increase by up to about 40% of agricultural production in the continent will fail if the world was to reach two degrees. This then means that different approaches need to be applied. For example, like nature-based approaches, what is also called the ecosystem-based adaptation approaches, where across the continent we see agricultural, agroforestry techniques that actually help to prevent erosion and rejuvenate the soil. We will see techniques like applying organic fertilizer that help water retention capability and soil chemical processes to go. But one aspect that also needs to be looked into 
is that because of the extremity of the climate change events, whether it is heavy floods or droughts, each and every nation needs to make water harvesting become a national culture. Because most of the times when the rains will be heavy, and then when the droughts come, there will be no rain. So harvesting water, making water harvesting become part and parcel of national culture becomes important because that water can also be used for irrigation. But more importantly is if you look across the entire African continent today, three quarter of the population depends on a staple like maize. But maize is going to fail under the changing climate as the scientific reports are showing us. And then there, need, there is need to focus on climate resilient crops. For example, like cassava, which is a climate resilient crop and can be able to produce up to about 300 products. And as a result of this, it means that if we can diversify as a continent to leverage on climate resilient crops like cassava and add value to it, we'll be creating opportunities and at the same time also adverting the changing climate impacts that are already being felt, especially in the stable maize, which is failing as a result of droughts that we see across the continent. And given the fact that the world has focused on fighting COVID-19 since early this year, would you say the world generally has lost ground in fighting climate change? What is happening is that the lessons from the COVID-19 emergency is also showing that climate change cannot be forgotten because before COVID-19, there was climate change. After COVID-19, there will be climate change. What the COVID-19 pandemic has shown is that you need a holistic approach because there will be emergencies. There is, this is a health emergency. There will be a climate emergency, environmental emergency. But what needs to be done from the lessons that the, the world is learning from COVID-19 is that a holistic approach that builds people's socioeconomic resilience becomes quite very, very instrumental to overcome emergencies. And so the building back better and building back different, leveraging on science, on solidarity, on, on environmental solutions, especially climate change solutions, will not only take the world, the world forward in terms of resilience, but at the same time also build, uh, create more opportunities, especially for the youth. So this has been a learning opportunity that can actually help ramp up climate action that will reduce more emissions below 1.5 degrees or keep the world below the dangerous climate change of going above two degrees. And uh, just finally, uh, Dr. Munyang, what would you say to those who are still doubting and questioning the science behind climate change? I'll answer that with an African proverb, which it goes thus, that if you close your eyes to facts, you will learn through accidents. Mm -hmm. Just a year ago, in the southern part of the African continent, Cyclone Idai and Cyclone Kenneth affected Zimbabwe, affected Malawi and Mozambique, and caused fatalities up to about 2,000 and displaced over about 2 million people and caused damages worth 3 billion. In the Horn of Africa, as that was happening, droughts actually impacted over 80% of livelihoods and plunged 15 million people to seek humanitarian assistance, increasing food prices by up to about 300%. These are realities showing that climate change is no longer an abstract issue. The world is already dealing with it. Africa is dealing with it. What is more important at the moment is not whether climate change is happening because it's visible. It's moved to the present and it's with us. It's what can we do about it and do about it in a way that turns challenges into an opportunity because in every adversity, there are hidden opportunities. This is how climate change should be looked at because taking climate action will drive socioeconomic transformation, create jobs for the millions of youth who are unemployed, lift mothers in villages from the bottom of the pyramid and put food on the tables of millions across the world. And that's how we can ensure that no one is left behind. So in short, the kind of attention that we give to COVID-19 should be also be leveled towards uh, climate change. Dr. Munyang, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your insight. Thank you for having me. There is Africa Regional Climate Change Coordinator for the United Nations Environment Programme, Dr. Richard Mnyang, joining us via Skype.